Um, okay, Mr. Thomas Sala, welcome back to the podcast. How you doing, buddy? I'm good, I'm good. Awesome, I'm really excited to talk to you because it's gonna be kind of a therapy session because you're, you seem to be such a chill solo game developer. You've had really good success in the indie game industry. And people have heard me rant and, and talk about how the indie game industry's, I don't know, or at least the game industry is struggling right now. And you've sort of walked me off of the ledge in recent months, just telling me about your thoughts about the indie game industry. And so I'm, I, I, I wanna talk all about that in this podcast. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've done in your career. All right, I'm Thomas, I'm Dutch. Uh, I've been in the game industry for, I don't know, 25, going on 25 years, doing all kinds of stuff, because in the Netherlands we didn't have AAA, so I've done everything up to AAA, uh, but including making games uh, for SEE, Sony Interactive, uh, so we had a first party published VR title, had a studio, didn't enjoy that, uh, then I went solo, made mods, if people might know me from, the Skyrim mods Moonpath to Elsewhere. There's a lot of game devs that have fun modding. Uh, did that, then I did uh, some solo games. Best known is maybe the Falconeer in the US, which was a Series X launch title. Uh, and just recently I launched Bulwark Falconeer Chronicles, which is uh, my attempt at uh, you know hacking together something that works on Steam and uh, is a stable, stable source of income success and enjoyable thing to work on. It's like a city builder, so. It seems to have worked, so uh, that's me. Wait, what's that called? The, it, so the city builder is called what again? Bulwark. Okay, so it, but it's part of the Falconeer brand. It's in the Falconeer right. unit. So yeah, we're going to talk about franchises okay. and IPs. Yes, yes. I, I cannot wait to talk about and, that. And, uh, for people that haven't seen it, so imagine, uh, I think I started out at the same time, it was a little bit before the Tiny Glade team. So come up in this second batch of people mm -hmm. who were inspired by Townscaper. So it's a really casual city builder, but it's in an open world. So it's like a 50 by 50 kilometer open world that has other people in it. You can go to war with it. It's like a, a, a sort of a, a chill 4X game. Uh, but with organic city builder, you know, a la Townscaper. So is it is it hitting the cozy game? No, I fucking hate cozy. No. Uh, <laughs> It's it's chill. It's chill. So it's it's. I like relaxed game. Yeah, I don't. I, I fucking hate. It's non micromanaged. So it's as streamlined as you can get. Yeah. There's resources. There's a bit of combat. There's making units. There's a, a, a modicum of diplomacy. There's all that. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's not intent to be deep. Just grand. You know. So you're yeah. building these entire big cities, but it, you know you're not managing the toilet paper at your barracks and shit like that. It's 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 casual, it's like a chill builder, but I don't like that cozy vibe. Why do I need to look at some childish baby shit when I'm trying to relax? I like stuff to be epic and full on, and I wanna build Mordor, then you wanna build Mordor, but uh, I don't wanna have spent 52 hours reading a manual doing it. So that's the, that's sort of the, the vibe. It's, it's weird, it's a weird combination of stuff, but I enjoy bashing stuff together and then confusing people so exactly okay so when it comes to i want to talk about universe building as it pertains to indie game developers i want to talk about that in just a sec but before we do that can you tell us was it was it easy for you to become a full-time indie game developer by the way if you're like me and you always dreamt of making an indie game as a full-time job i have a free webinar below that goes into exactly how to make six figures with just a demo i was just like you for years i thought i had to make a game in its entirety before getting a paycheck but there's actually three ways to make six figures before even finishing your game i've done this multiple times so check it out below if you do want to go full-time indie and thanks for watching it, it kind of it seems that way because you were part of the industry, the AAA industry, right? No, not the triple, but but the head that so the, 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 we did work for hire and outsourcing all that. Uh, I even worked for advertising and made web games and mobile games. But um, I think it's it touches upon this topic that I've seen where people because I'm a solo dev, so I work alone. Yeah, it's yeah. a topic. And nowadays, if you're if you're going on Reddit or game dev. It's all, you know, I'm a solo dove. I've been working on this game for two years and it's their first game. Uh, and they're often they're disappointed at what happens. Uh, so solo dove has become a byword. I am working on a game alone. Whereas for me, yeah. it's an end stage. <laughs> uh, and not even, I, I say it's an end station, but it's not even the best one. Cause I got burned out from working in teams. I don't think I could be manageable anymore or be a great manager. 
So, and then there's nothing else left for me than to make games. That's all I've ever done. That's all I'm capable of. That's where my talent lies by myself. So that's an end of life story rather than, you know, I'm just starting out. I, I, I just figured out Unity. Now I'm making my dream game. That, that, that's for me, that's, I've, I've never had that. I, for me, it was, this was the garbage, uh, you know, the, the parachute. Uh, or, no, or the yeah, garbage tube. Yeah, so this is it. This is what I ended up doing. So it happened because I couldn't go on in the studio. It's not a happy story, burnout, and uh, yeah. uh, 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 when you're not happy in your life, you get angry at stuff. It's very recognizable, and then it becomes hard to uh, be manageable. That's in the best way. So there's all these stories about assholes running studios, becoming dictators or abusing people. I got out just before that, but that would have been the end game. So, uh, and, and what happened, I started, I did some modding just, just to get me through a burnout uh, that was hyper successful, made no money because modding was free. Um, and then I rolled into it, well, I'll make an indie game. I failed at making one first because you got to have your failures. And then I made the Falconeer and Microsoft gave me a little bit of money and it was just enough for me to go sit with my, uh, my partner, mother of my children and say, I got a little bit of money. I got us a year and a half. Um, I want to do this, but if it fails, yeah, we'll both, you know, we need to find an actual jo real world job, you know, work at McDonald's or whatever. Uh, it wasn't that dire, but Microsoft gave me some money. So I knew there was going to be some success and that's how it rolled. And then I just said bye to the studio and left with uh, whatever I had. How did you get money from Microsoft? A lot of people listening right now are like, what? It's like, it almost feels Im like impossible. Everything's changed now. We'll talk about later, but every, we all know the industry yeah. in the last two years. Has, but back in the day, so this is only four years ago. I know, but it was so different back then. It was so different. Yeah, and there's, these things still exist in a way. So there's still, so there's different tiers of things you get. So the top tier for Microsoft is a Game Pass deal. So for a Game Pass deal, you get X hundred thousand, or some people even got million plus deals yeah. for their game to be exclusive on Game Pass. Uh, but so, so the first thing you, but that's the end game. The, but the first thing you can sell is exclusivity. So Microsoft digs your game and they will want you to release it only on their platform. So this was big for a decade before uh, the modern times is that you would sell, that's where we got exclusive from. You know, uh, it wasn't always just, oh, Microsoft, this is a Microsoft studio or Sony studio. No, they would just find this game and say, well, okay, we'll give you a lot of money to be exclusive to our platform for a period, let's say a year or sometimes fully. Uh, and then that's how you got, oh, it's only releasing on PlayStation. And then suddenly a year later it would release on the Xbox, stuff like that, yeah. or PC. Uh, yeah. Well, so four years ago, Microsoft did it that they would offer such deals, small deals, but you could still release on Windows because Windows is a Microsoft platform. People forget yeah. about that. Microsoft is Windows. So, so they had this really generous deal where they'd offer you a, a modest amount of money uh, for six months or a year exclusivity, and you could still release on Steam. Six months later or right uh, No, away. right at, right off the bat. Yeah, Apple did the same for me, by the way, with Apple Arcade, yeah. Yeah, yeah if it doesn't bite, they don't mind. So, uh, and then you get, and, and the budgets for that, I think, I believe the, I don't know, Dex, but back then it was, you know, around 100,000 whatever US mm -hmm. uh, was the top, I think, for small indies. And it's that's not a huge amount for for Xbox. Mm, it's, no. uh, so those, that, they would take some risks on that. They go, oh, this has potential. And basically I think it was exclusivity and they would, the budget was actually allocated for you to be able to afford to port it to uh, Xbox. Right. So uh, I didn't use it to port to Xbox and I don't think a lot of people did because you can do that for a lot less than 100. I use it to make yes. it finish the game. <laughs> did they know this? Yeah, and, but, and, and how did these deals happen? You just meet someone from Microsoft. I think that's the good thing about Microsoft. They were around, you know, Sony or even Apple or, oh, well, I've met Apple people, but Sony or even St Steam has never, up until recently, they weren't around at major events. Yeah. You couldn't find, well, they had a talk at GDC, but it's not like they were approachable. Now they have coffee setups and you can meet with them. But back in the days, uh, Microsoft were the ones that would go to like something like a game connection and be able on the schedule from, do you want to schedule a meeting with this senior person at Microsoft? And they'd look at your game and you can have a discussion about uh, what you want. And it's, uh, the fun thing is for any deal in life, which people, when you're fresh um, or naive, You'll get, oh, 
your first instinct to go to someone like Mark said, but what do you want? Uh, but that's not how it works. You say, well, and I said, that I want to release my game only on one platform and PC. You know, I don't want to have to do multiple portings because I'm by myself. That's a lot of work. So I'm looking for a home for this game to release on and attach to. And the Microsoft guy said, well, that, yeah, we can be that. Let's let's see what happens. Yeah. And then you go into this process of, you know, it takes nearly, it takes a god awful time to get a contract and it has to go to corporate <sighs> and stuff. But that's that's a way in and, that, and then there's like an escalator of deals that can follow ending up with Game Pass. Uh, but in the meantime, I had a publisher yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, but right. so, so you, you don't stumble in it. You have to be at the right places. This was a physical thing. You know, it was in San Francisco at Game Connection in 1998. Uh, no, it's, uh, 2018, not 1998. I'm not. So would you recommend people listening right now to go to these events and try and sign deals there? Or is it different now? Yeah. So, so um, uh, uh, they actually, there's ways to, ha- so nowadays you have the big indie pitch and all those you have all these things, and then they rec- they require because these organizations have to rent a space. There's like a hundred bucks or something, and yet, and and big deals are there. People are there mm-hmm. to make deals. People need games. You're making games. Be there. If you're not there, you can't compete. And it can also be virtually, but sign up for your game to be shown. A lot of this stuff is remote. We don't need to physically be there. It helps, uh, but yeah, for certain, be part of the scene is part of the success. If you're not yeah. part of the scene, nobody can make a deal. Nobody get can find you sympathetic or say, "Well, I, mean, I saw that game; it's really interesting. It's really tickling me. Uh, I want to help that person out." That can only help if they get to know you. Yep. So okay. yeah, being part of the scene. Did you have a demo to show them? Yeah. What was that like? Uh, well, practically, yeah. I think I had it running on a switch even because we didn't wow. have Steam Deck. So I brought a switch, which always worked because I had one from the old studio. Uh, back borrow and steal. Uh, I don't think that's allowed to be done, but uh, uh, everybody does it. Uh, so I had this, I had this mobile demo of the game. I had a trailer I made, uh, which wasn't released because back back then, and there's still publishers and parties like for games not to be released before you make a deal, so they can handle the release. I knew that uh, it was a like a, there was like one mystery. It's like a proper vertical slice, and it looked nice. So you could fly around and shoot stuff and do a mission and land. So they had the the game loop cohesive, if not unpolished, and just one mission. Okay. And I shot that around, and uh, so people could play it. I I, I think there there we came from a period for the last ten years where you could sell a pitch or a video or you could sell something that wasn't fully developed. I I think those days are gone. Nowadays you need a vertical slice to sell anything, uh, and it needs to be playable. Nobody's going yeah. to sign or give money on, on paper, even with the best pedigree. So really what you're saying is just a really strong demo. Everything trailer. else is bullshit. Every, you know, you need a pitch deck, but it's just pictures from your demo. It, it, uh-huh. and a pitch deck is just, you know, your face, who are you, what's your uh, uh, credentials, the, you know, the, the elevator pitch, you know, uh, uh, and then some screenshots showing some content of the game and how much content, and then a, a planning, yeah. that's it. Do these platforms, do this anymore because I'm getting the impression that at least in 2024 and maybe 2025, it's harder to strike a deal with these with the platforms, not publishers, but the platforms. Uh, yeah. deal, deals are gone for a little bit. Um, they're making deals with older games for less money. It's just money's gone for a little bit. Money you got back and then I want, want deals. Um, yeah. Though I think that the, the changes here are here to stay. I think some of these deals are still around they're just at different places. There's smaller deals for less money. Yep. In the end, I think it was an exceptional period of growth for games industry where a lot of money got thrown around. Um, it's not something you can count on. I think a lot of studios and people sort of started to count, oh, I can get a Game Pass deal or I can get some, some sort of deal and support. I don't think you can count on it regardless who you are. I don't think it's, 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 it's bonus money. I don't think it's, it's it, and I think a lot of people started to depend on it as, as a solid dependable part, yes, but it was yes. Microsoft growing their business and at some point that's always going to end. Yep, it's basically when you say that, I, I, I imagine it's something like Microsoft being willing to burn cash, Apple being willing to burn cash to, to catch up and, and get to the front of the line in this huge, like it was a subscription service race 
everyone was trying to get to the top of the, the sub- subscription service race. And now in 2024, it's almost like, I don't even know what, I don't know what the platforms want anymore. Do they want to start selling physical copies again? Do, are they? I do- think in a sense, um, but I, I'm very pragmatic. I, in a sense, I think there was a period where the big platforms like PlayStation or Apple or, or uh, Xbox, they thought they could be running the market. So they had to be in front with the newest games and the hottest games. And they figured out like net, that they thought Netflix, because Netflix the market leader, they always insatiable hunger for new content. Um, and they figured out that hunger isn't there. People are happy with games that are six months old or a year old. Uh, and they're still making the same money as they did when they announced all these big triple A games. Gotcha. Uh, uh, so they're saying, well, okay, we can get all these indies for cheap or the two double A's. We have our big flagship titles. They all failed to produce new games as a surface, hot yeah. tickets. So uh, I think this is here to, it's, it's an organ. I think they realize you can't beat Steam or the, or the places where indies are or where games are being, hits are being born, are not console, are not mobile. Uh, uh, they are in the organic place as well, basically Steam. Uh, mm-hmm. And these hits, then you can have them later and still have the benefit. So I think that's sort of where we're at now, that uh, the thing is consolidated, it's cooled down. Okay, so we, we're not gonna have a Netflix for games. Uh, we're gonna have it, but it's it's not, you know, uh, it's like it's always been. But right, right. It's not relying on new hits. Yeah, and for me, PC has, and Steam, especially, it's already won. Uh, they can't compete. So for for okay. for content creation, if you fail on Steam, there is no no survival. If you fail on console, yeah. it's not a problem as long as you're su- surviving on 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 Steam. Mm-hmm. And Steam is a meritocracy. It's flawed in many ways, but it is a system you can survive in. Uh, and whereas you have no control in on on consoles, you are at the mercy of a curated. And I I, I think people like you and me, I, two years ago we were begging for a curated service so we can service and visibility. And, and I think Valve were right; it's not going to happen, and it's not in your best interest because if you're not curated, if you're not in a happy few, you lose. So a, a surface that is a general open ocean and stuff bubbles up and that can be successful um, is in the end more, it's volatile and aggressive, and but it is fairer and you can survive. And if yeah. you do survive, uh, that's where Microsoft and PlayStation will make the deals. You know, it's, 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 it's interesting. It's like um, Steam is essentially a social media platform. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here. I think you, I think you have a better idea than I do. But the way I see it is, Steam is something like a social media platform because it's algorithmic, and it's your game can, your game will almost certainly thrive if you have a certain number of wish lists. So it's something like it's something like YouTube or Twitter, where it's like if you if you have a following, you're gonna sell your game. Okay, so I, I've been going around saying that the game industry will be like YouTube. So I think YouTube is the better analogy than say Facebook or, cause it's yeah. not a, so I don't think Steam is, I don't think Valve wants it to be a social network cause I've been begging for, I would love a proper yeah. timeline for me instead of the fucking blow, you know, the, you know, the shit to communicate with users is yeah. primitive on Steam. Uh, yeah. Or for someone like me and you, that this is a huge disadvantage cause we can't leverage our ability to create engaging contact or engage with the users yeah. beyond a yeah. fucking forum. Or, or you know a blog post, so it's it's outdated. So, but it YouTube is a great analogy. So if we look at YouTube, we've got triple A. It's let's call it Hollywood. So we have Hollywood. That's triple A. It's like a dip separate world. They've got celebrities, hundreds of millions. They've got Marvel properties we all love and known for fifty years. It's a separate world. Then there's YouTube. And YouTube has several stages. You have Mr. Beast and people like that who have their own ecosystem with their own PR firms making literally billions or millions. Uh, And then there are several, then there's an entire section of people who are making, you know, got a few million subscribers, they're making good money. You know, they might have their own PR agencies and they're making sponsor deals, but sponsor deals for like 50,000 bucks, not for 500 million. Uh, But underneath that, a lot of people who don't make any money are just hobbyists. Well, that's actually a perfect analogy for 
the games industry what we have. We have hobbyists, indies, and then we have double A or triple indies. Um, and YouTube surfaces them based on what they put in. Because you can see people, you know, if you're not gonna be professional on YouTube, you're gonna fail. If you're not at TwitchCon or whatever, if you're not making the networks, you're, th there is a path to success. If you don't follow the path, it's very hard to be successful. And yes, there are random occasional viral hits that go boing, uh, but uh, lots of people don't have to be that random ping. They just work at it and grow their audience and then make a living. So that that is, I think that's, a, a, that's where we're at and that's what it's gonna be. Uh, uh, and I think for people need to realize that and that's uh, when you're an indie that also means how do you do that starts to change how you deal with publishers and platforms because you're building your brand on your your real estate that should be your goal yeah. so uh, uh, this did, I think it's a, uh, just like don't build your bliss on other people's property and, 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 and Steam is as close as you can get to your own property whereas you know if you're in Game Pass that's not your property you can't manage your Xbox page or your PlayStation page or even your Apple page beyond some basic info this is not gotcha. the place you own but on Steam I can hack it I can try you know I can put up I don't have a timeline but I put up a blog every week and I'll use it as a blog uh, I have forums I can uh, integrate my Twitter and stuff uh, it's my store uh, and I can grow and connect all the products I have. So in a sense, YouTube and Steam are related in how I think they should be approached. And I think some of the interested cases are not necessarily people like me who aren't influenced by art people like you or yeah. uh, Pirate Software who are blending these spaces, figuring out how personality and a renown can, um, can help you be also a successful game dev and vice versa. Um, right. I think that's it. That is of this time. So that is one of the strategies to survive. I enjoy uh, watching, and it's, it's just you can see it happening in front of your eyes. So what we've got essentially is it's it's hard to explain, but basically it's something like audience ownership. So Steam allows you to build an audience that will will follow you and follow your work. And so if you build the Falconeer, you can then build another game on top of that audience and then sell to that audience again. Is that true? Yeah, it's 100% audience ownership. And, and uh, for me, the inspiration is not being a video celebrity, or uh, but it's being a fantasy writer because they do the same thing. You've bought the first three books from Game of Thrones. The fourth one was unreadable. Uh, it's too long, but you're already invested and you hope the fifth one is great. So you yeah. suck it up and buy the fourth one. That is owning your audience. So that's why 10 years ago or 20 years you buy a fantasy book and they'd be singular, a book. Oh yeah, he's got a new book. And then suddenly they started doing trilogies and now every fantasy artist do 12 pieces because that's where the money is. That's how you survive. You've owned your audience in you know a cycle of books. Uh, I do that as well with the franchise, which I, is just a different thing. It's just uh, you're a franchise because you're, uh, uh, you know, you're a content creator, you're a, a, a cult of personality in a way. Uh, uh, so that's your brand. My brand is a, is a detached from myself a little bit, but I'm sort of hybridizing. So it's part me, I'm the author, but the, it's the Falconeer universe. And it has its own uh, audience that I bring with me. So I think what the, the all these other places that where you can get extra money figure out is that it's people like that who have their own audience who are interesting because they can tap into that audience and that's where you can start to make deals again. You know, I've I've kind of gone through a lot of different paths of making money as a game developer. I, I think I've done almost all of them, um, and what I've found is that. If you want to take money from a publisher or you want to take money from a platform, it's totally fine if you have no money and you got to do it. I think people should do it at least to get started and get into the industry, right? Because you got to do something to go full time. I mean, you've, you've got to go full time to, to, to make a good game. But, but I love what you've done, which is, okay, been there, done that. It's time to do my own thing and self-fund and build my own universe. Well, I, I, I have a publisher, but I self fund so I hybridized, so I have a different type of deal. But the first, the uh -huh. Falconeer is done very conventionally because that money from Microsoft ran out 
and uh, mm. I needed uh, people to help me. Uh, but I, I am moving towards full self-publishing. That I think that's yes. that's where the future lies. So uh, I am hybridized for Bulwark is hybridized at the moment. Uh, but sometimes you need you can't do everything by yourself. But yeah, the publishers in general, I think the age of publishers for indies is sort of over because the money is not going to be there. Uh, mm. So the, the, it'll be the same thing. You will have publishers who will own their audience, like Devolver owns their audience. They have a very loyal audience and you're playing a Devolver game, not really a developer game. Mm. So those, those guys will be around, but the publishers that don't, I don't think they can survive because <laughs> the, the game is the, we're matured now you know we're competing with games five years old we're competing with competing you know ubisoft is in trouble because they're competing against their own games yep so where does the money come from if publishers are if publishers are dead and i'm not i'm not sure if i agree with you i'm 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 partly there but where where is the money going to come well from they're not going to be dead some of them is going to be still successful because there's people that uh -huh. need money but the let's put it like this the industry the amount of money that goes around for yes. new games so there's you know because we've given up half the industry to games as a service like fortnite whatever they're taking half the money together with old games so people with publishers with back catalogs will also survive you know, Ubisoft will survive because I still want to play Assassin's Creed 4, which is a decade old game, uh, but I haven't played okay. it. Uh, so, so that'll all be there. But for new games to be made, the market, the market will just be smaller. The market will keep growing. So the market will still be healthy, yeah. but it's not as big as it has been because you're competing with all these things. So yeah. if you're young and playing games, yeah, you're spending more money on what for Battlefield and Fortnite. And what's left, you'll try a uh any game once in a while but you're actually you you can only spend that money once so that's what the market that's what everybody's feeling we're all earning half of what we're, we're earning four years ago it's true uh it's and true. that's literally if you look it's literally half uh and that means that was actually the half we were sharing with the publishers so when you're now a studio and when you can afford you're looking at this case okay we're earning half or we can make half the game get half the marketing or you got a doubt and uh make your own game and then it becomes an interesting proposition. It's at some point, they say, oh, yeah, what if I don't port to console? What if I don't translate? I just release on Steam and play the Steam system. Yeah. And if it's a hit, then I'll find a publisher to do all these other things. You know, port it, invest it, do yeah. 26 languages, all that shit, make deals with Microsoft, whatever. And they can take their share because I'm already owning my, you know, my audience and my success. And then they'll come. Uh, so, so I think that in that sense, it's a different approach. We're going the entire idea of sim shipping is always, you know, it's not. Yeah, that's gone for me. I, I don't do that anymore. I, 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 I tell Indies now when I ask, I, said, I, I heard this story about a Polish publisher. Um, and apparently it's not a, not a beloved publisher because eh, whatever. But they go around when, when you pitch something, say, oh, we'll give you 10K, whatever, to make a trailer. Um, uh, and then we'll put the trailer in the show. So that costs them a little money. If the trailer does mer more than 10,000 wish lists in the first month, we'll fund whatever you need. It's all done. We're going to do it. If it doesn't, there's no bread in it. We're not funding it. And neither should you keep, keep continue working on it because it's not going to be a success. That is an extreme wow. example. And people go, oh, that's horrific and horrific. I think, no, that's just the future. That's where we're at now. This is what every indie who is serious about business that needs to internalize. You need to check if your game is going to be successful. And if, if it's whatever way you, you go, if it's not happening, then you need to make another game or you know, reassess what you're doing. Because uh, there's too many indies that, you know, oh, we, we, you know, they think they can measure the success at the end. And then they figure out, oh, it's not a success and they're in trouble. But that's the, the golden goose is not making the game, it's but figuring out if the game is going to make money. And if the game is not going to make money, you shouldn't work on it. That is a brutal reality. I think mobile game developers have more or less learned that lesson and thrived within it. And there's no space. There's not a lot of space for indies. So it's not it's not a cool future. But this is what's going to happen. Uh, and I mean, you can still be an indie and successful on mobile, but it's a lot harder. There's a lot fewer successes off there. But you got to You know, this is the this is the jungle we're in now. Okay. So I'm, I'm trying to formulate a framework here 
for people listening because you know they might be thinking wow like this is really disorienting what am i supposed to do uh is the framework something like the okay number one the money is not like it the money is not there like it used to be when it comes to publishers now from what i've heard publishers are not dead it's just that the money is not there like it used to be so a, a half a million dollar deal from a publisher is going to turn into something like a hundred thousand dollars right and you might and it might be a little bit more difficult to convince the publisher that you're trustworthy and that that you can make your first game profitable right if it's your second game or your third game it's going to be a lot easier to get a publishing deal for that kind of money granted you're going to get a better deal because the royalties will not be seen as big as they used to be Meaning it's not gonna be like a 50-50 share, it'll be like 20-80 or 30-70, your favor. So first question is, is that true? Do you feel like publishers are still there? Right now, publishers are still there and people are still yeah. making deals uh, in, in the sub five. I think uh, Simon Carlos from, uh, Carlos from Game Discovery said, uh, yeah, deals from above a million are drying up for indies or small studios, but games that make, there's not, fewer games that make around half a million net yeah yeah there is actually more there's quite a, a the group of game studios that are making games that hit you know that hit half a million or a million revenue you only end up with half a million gross or whatever still exist uh, yeah. the revenue for a publisher in you is only half a million from a million gross uh, so that's a smaller margin but that's still half a million up for grabs how you share it with, and a publisher that's able to be efficient with their money sheet that can still survive. So I, I, I don't think it's going well, but it, I, I think for, and you're talking about beginner developers. I think beginner developers need to leave, the, if you want to framework, the framework is you build a strategy for your success. That means instead of going, oh, I'm gonna make my dream game and it's gonna be a hit, that doesn't exist, sorry. <laughs> But what you can do is saying, well, I have nothing, but I know how to make games. I'm going to make a great little game and it's going to have, and then it's going to do an above average success. That's your first step. Then your second step is take that above average success, make a slightly bigger map, have an above, above average success. If you don't have an above average success, figure out what you're doing wrong, do it again. Then you make your fourth game and it's slightly bigger. And somewhere around a certain range could be your third, your fifth of your fifth, you might start to make a little money. That's the moment where another publisher might go, hey, this kid here's got this game, it's got like 25,000 wish lists. We can scale that. This is how it works in regular businesses. They come on when you have a little success and say, we can help you make your success 10 times as big. We'll invest because you already have a little success. If you go watch Dragon's Den or whatever you call it, Shark Tank, Yes. That's always what it is. It's people where well, we have a little success and this big guy goes, well, if I put in a couple of million, I can scale your success. That's how business works. So I think in the, the framework is to stop thinking in hits. Hits are not, hits happen yeah. if you have 10, you know, once it hits is when you can scale your success into a hit. But first you need to have a success that can be scaled. How do they know? How do, how do indies know? We, we have this fantastically open platform called Steam. You can release your game yourself. You can release it on Twitch and you can see in the numbers, am I doing or better than, worse than someone else? That's, it's that simple. So I'm by myself and, and, and yeah, if you have no money, you need to go, you know, you're in trouble, but you can do this when you're in college, when you have no kids, you can live under a bridge. <laughs> it's, it's horrific, but this is how everybody starts their business. You beg your aunt and uncle to help you out. And then you scale your, and you prove that you're successful. And that means that, 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 that you get experienced by doing it and you're iterating. So it's like the, the structure here is to make a, a road or a wall. You're building a house brick by brick. Every game is a brick. Your first brick is not gonna deliver you the house. And I think it's that mentality that is the structure for success is say, well, you're, it's a strategy, you're building all these bricks and at some point you'll have a wall and uh, the, the wall might support the roof and that's where you can ask someone in. Uh, what is the house in this metaphor? Is the house a solid, financially successful career? I think that the house can be a uh, pirate software, part streamer, part game dev, or Thomas Brush or so. The house yeah. can be a Thomas Sala that has a franchise, he put all this energy in, and the franchise starts to grow. The The house can be your reputation where people say, okay, this dev, he just makes crazy fucking original games. 
they're small, they look like, but and then and you get small success and get bigger and bigger. Um, um, it is whatever is your skill or what it when you know what you're going for, what you're discovering about yourself that you can do. Maybe you make great music. You know, it's a game with fantastic soundtracks, uh, and you skill from that. Mm. Whatever, so, I know there's a thousand ways, a million ways to get there. Yes, yes. So the 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 problem is is that a lot of people listening right now they're like I cannot find it. They 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 want to try and get some money. They want to get some funding now while they're working on their demo, while they're working on their game. I know for me when I was working on my game. Uh, my first game, I had to figure out a way to quit my job. Like, I just had to do it. Because there was no way I was going to finish that game as a hobbyist or a part-time developer. And I had all these games that I had released, like small little prototype games. But I was ready to finally be funded, right? So, in terms of funding, in terms of funding and getting funded and going full-time, is it that different from something like 2016 or 2015 like where you could still find a publisher and you could still you could still work with a platform you could still do a kickstarter yeah yeah and i think all the most of these things we're actually more kickstarters now uh, yeah yeah i'm feeling that too and there, so there's more kickstarters now they're all smaller amounts so, yeah. and so yeah. that's and they're all like, oh, we're kickstarting for 50k or 30k. Mm -hmm. But if you're mm -hmm. by yourself, 50k, yeah. I'm sorry if you live in San Francisco, you're fucked. Uh, but if you live in Colorado, you might be fine for 100k. Uh, yeah, for two years. Uh, uh, it's, it's. I think the expectation people, have, and, you know, I, I want funding, and then I'm gonna be a startup. You're not in a business of a startups of fucking right. having coffee shops inside your business. You're a fucking game dev. You're like a musician. It's going to be a crawl. Uh, and you might get to yeah. a point where people pay for you to see you at a festival and shit is moderately okay. Uh, but really, if you think musicians are all rolling in it, uh, very few are. Um, yeah. so, so I think people need to get that mind. We're not in a... Did, did you are... You are going to make... If, if you, unless you become really smart and figure a strategy and work towards a strategy... Um, you are going to be working for other people's money, uh, uh, and that's that's because uh, you're creative and you're not you know you're not suited for this business part. But the, if you can figure out a way to combine that and 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 scale up and 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 create your own audience that grows and it sticks with you, uh, then you you can you can work and get big successes and do all these yeah. things. So the the way that I see that is. Everything that I, I, okay, I'll speak for me. Everything that I've done in, in terms of going full-time indie and building a brand for myself, I also partnered with other publishers. So just so everyone's aware, you know, I, I've signed deals that are as small as $30,000. I've signed deals upwards of, I can't, I can't say the exact numbers, but over 250K in funding, right? All of these deals, from what I'm hearing and from you and other game developers, is those kind of numbers are still there. It's it's more like these big two million dollar deals that you're going to sign with Annapurna. I don't million think million those are there there dollars. anymore. Even Annapurna yeah. is no longer there. So hey, I know. Well, they started over. Yeah, I think because game publishers will figure out that if you want to make a game that makes five million, which used to be an indie game, could make that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, if you, nowadays, that has to be a business. <coughs> yeah, that needs to be a game with longevity, or, or be a game as service, or a life, yeah. or a multiplayer component. And you need to set it up as a business with support, and then you can scale the business. Yeah. Uh, that requires a lot of money, uh, and I, so I, I think that's different from the fact that what we all want is making games that fit our creativity and skill mm -hmm. and our mm -hmm. you know artistic canvases for stories we want to tell etc cetera, etc cetera. that's not a business so so i think we feel i i am very cynical in that that period is gone uh, but you can still make a living as an artist if you can game the system um i don't think it's it's i don't it's it's just a maturation of the market so i think we just need to let it go of a lot of naivety and, and there's a lot of people who had it really well, let's be honest, yeah. I had it really well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so did I. We, we, we signed some deals 
uh, my studio, I signed some deals with some platforms that I look back on those numbers and I'm like, how the heck did that happen? How it, they were throwing out? They were, dude, they were just drooling cash in 2020 and 2019. It's not that way anymore. But I want to encourage everyone listening right now. If you're, if you want to, I think kind of what you're saying, Thomas, is if you're gonna treat it like you're a writer, almost like you're. It's kind of like Stephen King. Okay, he used to. He would just pump out these books so quick, like two a year, three a year, just bang, 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 bang. Pump out these quick books. He'd do them fast, and he would sign. He would sign deals with these um, book publishers, and I think Carrie, he signed Carrie for like thirty or thirty thousand bucks back in the 70s or 60s. The, the reason I bring that up is, is indie game developers, everyone listening right now, if you can make games quick, if you can do it in six months to a year, uh, you can sign deals with publishers and make 100K and use that money to go full time. It's totally possible. You could go on Kickstarter and raise 50,000 bucks to 100,000 bucks and make a small, tight game with a very tight, unique loop and unique graphics like Thomas, your your art is very unique. I think it's one of the primary reasons why your universe sells. It has a very beautiful, unique look. But the point is, is that indie game developers that are budget conscious, small, and they make small, tight games. I feel like that's the path forward for indies right now, which is small, tight games that have a strong identity. And if they wanna sign a deal with a publisher and get 50K to go full time, that's totally possible because you can live on 50K for a year and finish a tight game. And that game could make 300K, which is a, that's a pretty good margin for the cost invested. What, what do you think about that, that sort of framework? I, I, um, oh, so, so I think there's, it, it, mostly you're right. I think you're right. I think it's not the only way. So that's one. Yeah. So the other way is to be, uh, build a, a franchise from scratch and start, you know, I, I like to say, add to that, don't throw away anything. So I hate, so I do like be fast and iterate and be, because I do my games in two years, that's my goal, less than two years, make big, big, visually yeah. stunning games, uh, not six, seven years, because that's just dumb. Um, but um, it's to not throw away anything. So if I, I, I sometimes say kill game jam culture. So I think people need to be very careful mm. and not confuse what you're saying with, oh, I need to game jam something new every five months. No. Uh, no. the, 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 the fallacy with Game Jam is that if I made something original uh, and then uh, it doesn't work, I need to go back to the drawing board and make something else original. But it's actually the fallacy, the, the way forward is you make something quick and then you analyze why it's working and not working. And that doesn't mean you abandon what you've learned. We say, wait, let's say you make a city builder, first city builder, doesn't do great. Then, oh, now I'm gonna make a, an FPS multiplayer and you lose all the lessons you've learned from, multi, from your city builder. So that's, I think, something people, that's what I mean, be strategical also in your development, is that you recognize what you're doing, what your strengths are, and that you build upon what you build. So and that also increases the tools you have. I am using tools I made seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years ago in my latest game. Because, and that's fucked when, what Unity does, and so, but it's a separate sideline. But the idea is you build upon the assets, you don't throw away stuff. So that's one part of it. And the other part I think is to learn from that video story where people made a trade. You don't need an entire game to gauge if your project's going to be successful. You could, and people sign, may find this disingenuous, but uh, I work towards vertical slices and demos and, that, and then making sure people that can play that. I had that evolving demo where people could fairly early play the game and you know, and then you have to deal with people not understanding it's not finished or you know even early access. I don't think early access, I have my own reasons to dislike it, but the concept of co-development, co-creation is that you're flexible and, and you get validation for what you're doing. Uh, so the validation, I think you might spend two or three years on a game if you have the money and you have the confidence to do it and the skills and experience, but you need to do so based on validation. Bulwark, my city builder, we released a trailer and it was in a future game show. It did 25,000 uh, uh, wish list in like two days. Yep. There was no demo? There was no demo. It was just an announce. That was the announce. Wow. Where did you announce the trailer? No, that was uh, the future game show, which one of the, I don't know. And so it was, it was just a 30 second clip in the future game show and it popped for people. Because you can come out of that with 5,000 wish lists. 
uh, we did 25,000. The morning after was like 20,000. I went to the, we were at Games Court. Yeah. Is this a real number? Yeah, fuck, it's a real number. Uh, uh, so, but that's, that's validation. But it would have been great at 7,500 7, in the first week. Or uh, uh, so then you know you can because I think that ten thousand in the first month is actually a good target, uh, but then you're validated and that gave me the confidence. Okay, I'll to try to do it in two, but it could be in three years. So yeah. I think that's another part of the equation is validate early, and if it's not coming, because people that are creatives, we are so fucking will keep you know pulling that dead horse because we put all our love and energy in it, but for the money you can't change, you can't turn a dud into a hit doesn't you know it's that it's an urban legend uh yes. it's you can't yes. polish up that turd do you need to let go and move on <laughs> and take from it if it's a, you know yeah. if it's a city builder or is it you learn and you you keep at it make a better yeah. city builder it, it could be as simple as maybe the 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 loop or the graphics or there's just not a hook there but you still you still have a system that you can build on top of right yes and that, that's so, so people are so, you know, that I think this is all emotion. If, and I'm super emotional. I, I, I don't, you know, uh, I don't, I can't live what I preach, but I'm sure, you know, I do aspire <laughs> to it. But um, is that when you see your, you don't want to hear the feedback. You don't want to see that you're failing. And people go, oh, if I only add more narrative or own, oh, if they could only see the third trailer or if they could only see the demo. Uh, and you're putting, you're putting, you're you're ignoring the reality that if you're not succeeding, you can, you know, that's the great thing at Steam. It will show you and tell you if you're succeeding. So a game that starts off and oh no no we put up our trailer and we're still at a hundred wish list. What am I doing wrong? Doesn't matter what you're doing. You will know, figure out what you're doing wrong, but it's not working and it's not fixable. So people are asking for advice how to fix yeah. it. It's not fixable. You should ask advice. How do I should? What should I do next time? better what did i learn how did, so that's the i think and then you know once you do that steam can be predictable because it's algorithmic also means that if you hit something with 50000 wish lists by and large you will sell x amount you won't sell sell zero and there's a huge bandwidth based on how you do but uh, there's lessons in it and i think the goal for steam for valve is to make it more predictable uh, uh, and that is good for devs it might be harder to to get better at it, but that uh, you can. Man, dude, that is that is so. Like it, it's <clears throat> it's it's almost basic advice that most people should just know by default. But I don't I don't think that they. Well, we we did we didn't have to learn this for I think fifteen years from the first, you from the, in, the indie and death, and the movie, movie, all the way up to yeah. 2017 or something, we, or 2020, we didn't have to learn it because there wasn't enough of us to fill the demand and people yeah. were making ridiculous amounts of money. And now all of that is gone. There's more people to fill whatever demand. So it's a competitive field and you need to start applying so fairly basic business rules. Yeah. And that's what like, you've heard all this stuff before from anybody giving out business advice. Because uh, it's basic business advice. It's pretty basic, yeah. It's like you know, prove, prove the prototype, and before you try, you scale it, you know, and scale up to a point that you deserve a funding deal, that you've got yeah. the numbers that where a publisher can, and it's all going to be algorithmically. Every publisher, of course, they're going, they're looking for the cutoff point. You don't have fifty thousand wish lists. Sorry, you're not interesting. That's the message exactly. where people will get ha will get back because that's the amount we can expect you to do by yourself organically if you have a successful game, and that yeah. number will change. And if you can't reach it, you're not ripe, and that is a tough lesson for a lot of people. Uh, but that means you know, okay, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you improve, and those that improve will you know it's like a swim up river and reach uh, the safe ground. That's brilliant. I love that. Well, let's let's wrap up here, man. My wife is my wife is calling me right now, saying she needs me for for daddy duty. Um, but that dude, that is such good advice. I think that's a perfect place to land the plane. Um, we we my I, I want my audience listening right now before we wrap up to number one, click the link below to check out your games. Um, you've, you're you're such a shining example of how to create a tiny like a diamond of a game it's just it's small but it's hyper it's it's tight and it's hyper valuable for the players and that 
that you had to prove, right? You had to prove that prototype. And so that's, that's what I want my audience to do is prove their prototypes and focus on making those prototypes um, provable. I think that's a really good yeah, place to and valida- land. Validation and don't lie yep. to yourself. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's, that's that's and you'll be fine eventually. Oh man, that's great. Thanks so much for for taking cheers, the time, man. Thomas. That was really good, man. All right, cheers. By the way, if you're like me and you always dreamt of making an indie game as a full-time job, I have a free webinar below that goes into exactly how to make six figures with just a demo. I was just like you for years. I thought I had to make a game in its entirety before getting a paycheck, but there's actually three ways to make six figures before even finishing your game. I've done this multiple times. So check it out below if you do want to go full-time indie. And thanks for watching.